Hi, my name's Jane Kingsley-Smith. I'm a professor at the University of Roehampton in London, and I'm thrilled to be part of the Shakespeare 2020 project. I'm going to give you here a very brief introduction to Shakespeare's sonnets. I suppose there are three basic questions that we could start to think about with the sonnets. First of all, what are they? Um, second, why did Shakespeare write sonnets? Um, and third, what are their subject matters or preoccupation? What, what are they about? Um, if we start to think about what Shakespeare's sonnets are, uh, obviously we need to know what a sonnet is. Uh, a sonnet is a, a brief, uh, usually romantic lyric, although you can also get religious sonnets as well, uh, 14 lines long. Um, and Shakespeare sonnets are divided usually into three quatrains, which all rhyme um, and uh, rhyme in couplet at the end. Um, Shakespeare's sonnets as a collection is 154 individual poems, all of them in the sonnet form. Um, and these were first published in a collection by Thomas Thorpe um, called Shakespeare's sonnets in 1609. Um, and 1609 is is interesting because by this point the the heyday of um, sonnet sequences in English literature is, is pretty much on the wane. Um, the sonnet is an Italian form. It comes from the word sonetto, uh, meaning um, little room or small kind of poem. Um, and these have kind of come over um, through the agency of Thomas Wyatt and the Earl of Surrey in mid 16th century. Um, but they become very popular in a, a sequence form around 1591 with the publication of Sir Philip Sidney's Astrophil and Stella. So 1609 is a long time after, um, you know, the sonic craze. So we might wonder um, why then uh, and whether Shakespeare in fact ever wrote the sonnets to be published or whether he had other um, intentions. Um, if we look at the title page of... Thorpe's collection. And you just see that there. One of the things that's interesting about this is it doesn't say sonnets by William Shakespeare. It says Shakespeare's sonnets. And this might well suggest that Shakespeare wasn't authorising the publication. He wasn't even in London at the time, potentially. Um, but that Thorpe knew that because of Shakespeare's reputation as a dramatist by 1609, you know, he's a celebrity, his name gets bombs on seats, as they say, and has also um, created a considerable body of plays that you can buy, um, that to publish his sonnets, that there's an, an audience um, for that kind of publishing undertaking, whether or not Shakespeare is, is happy with that. Um, the other thing it says on this title page is never before imprinted. So again, this idea that you're being um, offered a, a rare opportunity to, to um, access um, Shakespeare's poetry. Uh, and this is interesting because Shakespeare um, had been most popular as a poet in 1593-1594, the beginning of his career with these narrative poems, Venus and Adonis and The Rape of Lucrece. Um, so in a sense, his career has kind of come full circle, publishing as a poet in 1609. Um, but of course, Shakespeare's sonnets um, have been around for much longer than this. You know, it's possible that he was writing them across a period of about 27 years. Um, the first reference to the sonnets is by Francis Mears in 1598 in an incredibly tedious book called Pallidus Tamia. Um, and he likens Shakespeare there to Ovid and describes alongside the narrative poems the existence of his sugared sonnets among his private friends. And private is obviously quite a titillating word there. Um, so this idea that these are secret, illicit, intimate poems that only Shakespeare's elite circle have been allowed to read until now. But now these are being offered to you as a member of the public. You can find out Shakespeare's secrets and maybe that of this kind of aristocratic clique as well. Um, we don't know which poems, which are the sugared sonnets that exist at that point, but in 1599, two of the sonnets are published, and this is in a collection called A Passionate um, Pilgrim, and this was published by William Jaggard um, in 1599, and it starts with two Shakespeare sonnets, and these are 138 and 144, um, 
when my love swears that she is made of truth, I do believe her, though I know she lies. And the other one, two loves I have of comfort and despair. Now, these are not necessarily the poems that you'd want to introduce Shakespeare's sonnets um, through. Um, they're not seductive. They're about deception, treachery, betrayal, kind of th the threat to your mortal soul in the second one. Um, so it seems unlikely that Shakespeare had offered up these two poems um, to Jagged. Um, the rest of the collection contains three lyrics from Love's Labour's Lost and some other poems by Richard Barnfield um, and even one by Christopher Marlowe, which was already quite famous. So the idea that this whole volume is Shakespeare's poetry is, is blatantly untrue. Um, so anyway, 1598-1599, obviously some poems are circulating in manuscript and a couple of them get into print. Um, what the 1609 quarto does is to put 154 sonnets together and it puts them in an order and in a sequence. And this has been hugely influential in how we read Shakespeare's sonnets. Um, and we often talk about them in terms of discrete kind of clusters or sequences. So it's worth, you know, just being familiar with that. So the first 17 are often called the procreation um, sonnets. And these are quite impartial third person poems, which address obviously some young, beautiful man and say, you know, now is the time to, to reproduce. You should get married. You should have a child. Um, so there's no sense of personal investment by Shakespeare. He's not emotionally engaged if, if Shakespeare is writing in his own voice here. Um, so there's a little grouping there. We then move into um, the biggest kind of tranche of poems which seem to express Shakespeare's love for one or more kind of male addressees. And there are other um, mini sequences in there. There's a section on... Um, Shakespeare's difficulty in writing as a as a poet. How do you praise someone when you've already used up all your um, flattering terms and when lots of other people are trying to praise them in the same time? And the, the existence of a potential rival poet emerges in, in those poems. And then at the end, um, a, a shorter sequence often described as addressed to the dark lady. Um, so a mistress. So 127, sonnet 127, starts talking about a mistress, whereas 126 had talked about um, a boy. So there's a suggestion, there's a kind of fracture there at 126, um, splitting it into two addressees. Um, at the end of, of those poems to a dark lady, if that's what they are, we have two Cupid poems, which are very, very similar, suggesting that they might actually be drafts. One of them is a revised version of the other. And then this um, very interesting complaint poem called A Lover's Complaint, which is published by Thorpe in the same volume, although you know, critics have um, disputed whether Shakespeare actually wrote it or not. Um, so emerging from the ordering that Thorpe has created, um, we have kind of dramatis personae. We have the speaker, who is also a poet, and, you know, we all kind of slip into talking about him as Shakespeare himself. But obviously poets don't always write in their own voice. So there's a question of how seriously we should take that idea of Shakespeare expressing himself through the sonnets. Um, and then there's the idea of a fair youth or a friend, uh, a dark lady. Um, I mean, these are kinds of labels that we've really made up because we don't have any names for anybody in the sequence. This is one of the fascinating things about, and one of the idiosyncratic features of Shakespeare's collection, is that pretty much all the other sonnet sequences that had been published, particularly in the 1590s, have a female addressee in the, in the title, uh, or even a couple, so Astrophel and Stella, um, Laura, Lycia, Delia, you know, women's names are usually at the forefront. Shakespeare doesn't use any um, any personal names except for his own. Um, so there were lots of puns on Will 
in the sonnets. And there's even one, I think it's 136, where he says, my name is Will. Um, so that's encouraging, obviously, a biographical reading of the collection. But I think, you know, biographical speculation has made up the vast majority of criticism on the sonnets. And in many ways, it's, it's kind of um, inhibited our engagement with them as lyrics, um, because we're always trying to kind of chase this narrative about Shakespeare. Um, so the question of why Shakespeare wrote the sonnets is, is the fascinating one. Um, he didn't need to, obviously he's a professional dramatist by this point, um, a hugely successful dramatist, he has shares in the Globe, um, and it's very unusual for a professional playwright to write sonnets. Um, you know, other dramatists who produce sonnet sequences, um, like Fulk Greville, for example, um, wrote privately they wrote um, closet drama, we call it, rather than for the professional stage. So this in increases that argument that maybe these are Shakespeare's intimate, private reflections. Um, another argument is that they're kind of a sketchbook for the plays. So he's practicing soliloquies. Um, and, you know, potentially you could hear the voices of, of other characters in some of the sonnets. Um, you know, one of them sounds a bit like Cleopatra, one of them is a bit like Falstaff. Um, so, you know, is he, is he practicing, um, for the soliloquy? Is he, you know, refining his poetic, um, his use of rhetoric, artifice, imagery? Um, so, you know, it's an interesting question how heartfelt you think these poems are. And I guess finally, what, what topics, um, we're looking at? Obviously, time is hugely important in the sonnets. Um, they start off in Thorpe's ordering with this question of time as this predatory, um, destructive, um, overpowering force. Um, and you can only defeat time um, by producing your own child so that your line and your beauty will live on. Um, a bit further on, Shakespeare suggests that the poet um, can rescue um, his beloved um, from time through the poetry. So that's a recurrent kind of theme. Um, but there are also moments when he just has to admit defeat, um, the idea that, that time is, is too much for any of us. Um, one of the things that's most fascinating, I think, is, is the romantic reputation that the sonnets have. Um, you know, we, we view them as a kind of superlative expression of um, romantic love and of desire. Um, in many ways, they're fairly kind of hapless um, romantic epistles. You know, you wouldn't really manage to seduce anybody with most of these poems because they're so often about inequality, um, unreciprocated passion, um, you know, despair, anxiety. Why doesn't this person love me as much as I love them? And this is this inequality is built, we think, on a social inequality. So the idea that um, Shakespeare's speaker is older than the, the beautiful youth and of a, a different social class. Um, and that's one of the things that's most fascinating about them, is, is that idea of how can a relationship um, survive when one person has all the, the kind of power and all the social attributes, all the beauty, all the grace, all the money, all the status, and the other person doesn't, you know, is, is it possible um, for that love to succeed and, and to thrive and to be something that's ennobling to both people? And there's a lot of shame in Shakespeare's sonnets, a lot of sense that he has encouraged this um, fair youth, if we think of it in those terms, to sin, to behave badly, um, to, to kind of act however he likes because he's been so relentlessly worshipped and adored by Shakespeare. So the consequences of writing love poems are also a very fascinating theme in the sonnets. So I hope you enjoyed. Thank you.